Welcome back everyone. Bullet Trains Spectrum, ESCOM Mega Cities, the South African Reserve Bank's mandate, GDP growth. What do all these words have in common? They were mentioned in Cyril Ramaphosa's over 12,700 word State of the Nation address. But could money be made from these words or are they a dream yet to be fulfilled? I am joined in the studio by Vessels Ubat, Investment Associate at Canon Asset Managers and Chris Holdsworth, a Chief Investment Strategist at Investec Wealth and Investments to find out more. Gentlemen, thank you so much. The muted reaction in the RAND, if I begin with you, Vessels, for some was quite telling of how the market did think of the State of the Nation address. Nothing new to really inspire real confidence. Did you feel the same? I think, yes, definitely. And I think it comes down to we've heard it all before. The, the speech has been repeated a couple of times. The promises that were made were made before. Um, I think what it is definitely a positive speech, let me put it that way. I think what the market is waiting for is actual evidence that we're going to see growth, we're going to see job creation. And those are the things that I think the market actually wants to see evidence of before they kind of react to it. All right. I mean, Chris, Vessel saying that it was a mostly positive speech. Do you share the same view? Yeah, it was very inspiring. But I agree with the sentiment for Vessel entirely. What it lacked was, was detail. I think what the market was hoping for and perhaps even expecting was some form of granularity around how the ESCOM financial situation is going to be resolved. We did hear that of the 230 billion allocated to ESCOM is going to be front-loaded and some of it will get to ESCOM in the next few years, but we didn't hear how much and how is that going to be financed. Is it the taxes? Is it the selling of SOEs? Is it more debt issues? All of these things are likely to be market moving, but we didn't have that information. As a result, you're quite right, the market response was fairly muted. I mean, in terms of how it will be financed, that, that fast track bailout, so to, so to speak, of ESCOM, I'm hearing a lot of, or reading a lot of commentary regarding the issuance, so increased government issuance of bonds. Do you think that, you know, investors like yourselves would be takers of this and this, and, and, and could it possibly be a, a good addition to your portfolio? Well, the, the timing for the SA government is quite fortuitous because what's happening at the moment is globally, government bond yields are declining materially. And the French government last week could borrow for negative yields. It's $12.5 trillion worth of debt globally that's offering negative yields. So there are a lot of investors globally that are hunting for yield, and, and we offer yield in abundance. Um, if the South African government were to issue debt, you're looking at about 9% versus zero or close to zero for a number of developed markets. So I, I don't doubt that there would be takers. The, the issue would be at, at what price? And, and would it imply being downgraded by Moody's? And then there's a question mark, because Moody's has previously expressed their unhappiness with the trajectory of debt to GDP. This would certainly worsen that trajectory. And so it comes to the point, is it going to be enough to see a downgrade, in which case perhaps the, the price would be higher than the just below 9% that government debt currently trades at. Vessels, I mean, your take on what was said regarding ESCOM, did, was it fulfilling enough for you? Or like Chris, do you feel that there was a lot of detail lacking in how we would move forward with ESCOM? Yeah. No, for sure. A lot of the detail was lacking. And I think the magnitude of the bailout was slightly more than, than the market expected as well, which is a bit of a concerning thing. And specific detail around how it's going to be funded, as Chris mentioned, is very, very concerning. Normally when you look at a lot of other countries, they look at GDP or government debt to GDP. Um, and recently a lot of external providers have started looking at South Africa as the, the government GDP as well as SOEs included because the SOEs are carrying quite a lot of debt that's effectively guaranteed by government when you look at the bailouts that government every time or supplies them every single time when something goes wrong. So I think there's a lot of detail needed. Um, I do think there are a lot of investors that would be willing to take up the bonds, however, because the global hunt for yield is, is there. And as Chris mentioned, luckily a lot of guys are now raising um, debt at quite cheap rates. The US signaling that increase or interest rate increases are kind of off the table and cuts are more likely. Um, also signals that a lot of guys are going to go to emerging markets and higher yielding building countries. Mm. I mean, talking about that GDP growth, so the president's saying that he's targeting a GDP growth above population growth now, which is, I understand population growth at around 1.6%, so GDP growth may be around, averaging around 2%. In this 2% growth environment, which many say is more realistic than the 5% that we are targeting under the, the, the NDP, which stocks do you think are, are likely to, to benefit? How do you position yourself in, in, in a 2% growth environment? It's, I think 2% for the economy as a whole would be very, very beneficial. A lot of our companies have traded down 
uh, you can see the companies bringing out growth estimates of a lot closer to the 0.6% kind of GDP measure as their base. So I do think a lot of stocks, stock prices have actually adjusted for that. Taking the retailers as an example, the retailers have come down significantly. If you do get an increase in the GDP growth rate, you'll see an increase in unemployment, oh, in, in, in um, employment, employment, in jobs, <laughs> as well as discretionary or disposable income, right? And that would be a significant boost to the retailers who have been under severe pressure over the last couple of years. So those stocks specifically would do quite well. We've got a lot of, so what happened in the construction sector is they've been particularly hit hard mm -hmm. by all the GDP or the lack of GDP growth. So much so that a lot of the sector has actually fallen out of the, out of the, well, out of business actually, mm -hmm. and delisted off the JSE. So when construction starts improving again, you'll have very few firms um, who you can go to for mega projects, which means that their margins will be very, very good. But you need, to see the you need to see the growth. On top of that growth, though, with the, the 100 billion rand infrastructure fund, which was also mentioned in, in, in this speech, but not much detail mm. again, because we've heard it before, could this also be you know, the saving grace for that construction sector? It could. If we actually see this, the funding or the spending coming through, it's definitely, it definitely would be a big driver for the construction industry, which creates quite a lot of jobs as well. Um, but to that point, on the road construction, for example, we've been promised quite quite a large allocation over the past couple of years and that has never come through mm. which just points to we need to actually see the deliverance thereof before we can see the yeah, the talk, talk, talk less, do more. Uh, Chris, a 2% growth environment right now, which the president is targeting, many say is feasible. Um, what, port, what stocks are you bagging in your portfolio as a result of this? I'm wondering, perhaps, could it even be the, the telecom sector, given that pronouncements were made about the release of Spectrum, which we should get further detail on in the, the next month or so? Yeah, firstly, 2% is not a huge stretch globally. Global growth at the moment is only 3%. Up until a couple of years ago, we used to run in line with global growth. Once we sort our ESCOM on the assumption that we do, 2% is very easy. If it does get to 2%, then yes, you would expect SA Inc. type stocks to do well. And as we sort of highlighted, retailers would do it well because of great employment, people having more money to go out and spend. And banks in that environment would do well too. And consumers would feel more confident. They'd be out there, they'd be borrowing more, corporates would be borrowing more, they'd be investing. As a result, construction would do well. On the telco side, it, it's very stock specific. And what would happen in the instance that you uh, made available more spectrum is that certain incumbents would lose out. We had a competitive advantage before and certain, certain cell phone operators would do better. So it's very much a stock specific story, but an aggregate the sector would do well. However, having said that, they have to find the capital to go and pay the state, which will use that money presumably to, to fund ESCOM. Okay, so I mean, in that stock specific telco scenario, can you give us more specifics around which uh, telcos would, like, would likely win and which would likely, you know, not be on the winning side? Um, it's, it's probably far too early to say, and the reason for that is it's entirely contingent on how much is going to be paid for the spectrum. There's lots of research done around the world about you land up winning an auction, but you lose because you pay too much to get the spectrum. And, and so until we get the cost, we actually can't say with certainty, sure, it would help out some companies to have more spectrum, but if they're going to overpay it, then it's not worth investing in. So we need to wait a while, and it may well be a long while before this gets resolved, and we can say with certainty which stocks are likely to benefit most. Mm. Vessels, your take on Spectrum and what this could mean for telco stocks? Yeah, no, definitely. I do think it's positive, uh, without a doubt. It depends all on price and then also depends on the sort of Spectrum that they release. So different ranges of Spectrum have different uh, travel lengths. If, you, if they do release Spectrum that's capable of um, carrying 5G, I think there's only about one license available in this space, but it also requires quite a heavy investment into CapEx, which would see returns pushed out into the future. When it's spectrum on the, on the higher end of length range, um, some of the winners like MTN and Vodacom potentially depends on who and what price um, can be very beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, a parting, parting uh, shot there, uh, Chris. The president uh, coming in full defense of the South African Reserve Bank and uh, saying, you know, it's, it's, its mandate is, is embedded in the, the Constitution, not looking for any changes there. To what degree do you think this, this could inspire his investment drive to get more funds into South Africa, but of course against this black backdrop of, of slowing global growth? 
Yeah, and I think he's put a pin in that entirely. Uh, there is no uncertainty remaining. The view from government is very clear that the independence of the SOG is sacrosanct and won't be jeopardised, and there is no intention to change the mandate at the moment. And I think investors required that message and it needed to be as strong as that. In terms of attracting international investors, international investors are willing to take on risk in a number of places. It's not that long ago that investors were buying 100-year Argentinian debt. There hasn't been a 100-year window when Argentina hasn't defaulted. So getting investors is one thing. In fact, what we're finding now is yields on ESCOM debt have compressed materially over the past six months ago. At the beginning of the year, ESCOM debt was trading about 9% in dollars. It's now below 6%. So getting interest in these instruments it is possible, and what it really takes is a bit of confidence and absolute certainty with regards to policy. And the more we move towards that, I don't think it's going to be difficult to generate interest for foreigners and follow that to generate investment. Well, quite a positive note to finish and the perfect note to end Portfolio Watch for this evening. Thanks once again to my guests, Vessel Ubat, who is an investment associate at Canon Asset Managers, and Chris Holdsworth, chief investment strategist at Investec Wealth and Investments. If you have any questions that you'd like us to answer or feel that there were some questions that were not answered, please do tweet us at CNBC Africa or email Portfolio Watch at abn360.com. From myself, Evie Peters, it's bye for now.